there's a drone. Hey, we're filming too, cool. Um, all right, so I think about this a lot, Kenny. Let's see if you do. I see people and they're like, if I don't do this thing, somebody else will, mm -hmm. right? If they say like, if I don't sell this person drugs, somebody else will. If I don't go to war and kill this person, somebody else will. If I don't, I don't know, be a stripper or a porn star or whatever, somebody else will. Yeah. Right? Like, there's nothing bad about this because if I don't do it, somebody else will. How do you feel about that? I feel like that's a cop out, right? Yeah. Um, you're not, first of all, if you're that kind of person, you don't, you, in my opinion is you probably already don't contribute very much to the world. True story. Um, and if you don't contribute much to the world, it's hard for a person like me or John or anybody else, I feel like, to respect you. So if you wander around and you wonder why nobody respects you, look inwards and wonder, am I that guy? Or girl. Or girl. Yep. Because, think about this, right? What if every one of us stood up and said, I don't care if everybody else in the world does it, I won't sell drugs. I don't care if everybody else in the world does it, I will not go and kill people. What if everybody else in the world said, you know, I don't care what they do, I won't do these things. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, guess what happens? Nobody does them. Yeah. And all it takes is one person to stand up and say, I won't do this. And then somebody else, is that gives them the courage to stand up and go, yeah, I don't want to do it either. What is it? It's not, it's not the first person, right? It's the, it's, it's the second. It's the first follower that starts a movement. Yeah. So, you know, you can have a leader, but if you don't have a follower, the second and third follower, then you're pretty much peeing in the wind. There's a lone wolf. Yep. But I just want to say, we will not do those things. And therefore, you can follow us. You can follow Kenny, because I'm already ahead. Yeah, follow me right into hell. No, not right into hell. I'm gonna follow you I mean, to lunch. Metaphorically speaking, you know. No. Right into discomfort. Into the battle of righteousness. Battle of righteousness, there yeah. you go. Yeah, boom. All right, we're gonna go eat lunch. Hey Kenny, what you guys drink? Cloud juice. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so, I wanted to show you guys the house that we're building for you because I'm so excited. Um, obviously today we did a bunch of stuff. We got the rest of this gable stitched up. We put these three windows in this wall. We're gonna put four more windows in this wall over here. There's gonna be a staircase. We're cutting a hole for the fireplace. Can you see that mic over there? So we're gonna cut a hole for the fireplace and put that in. And um, it's looking really good. It, it looks great. Thank Everything you. looks great. But I have a question for yeah. you. I was wondering what a load bearing wall is because, yeah. because. well, I'm seeing that that doesn't seem to be taking any weight. That's what is a load bearing wall? That is a great question. It's one that I get asked at least once a month, maybe more. <laughs> so come, come with me. Um, this wall right here, you're correct, yeah. does not bear a load, okay? Because this floor truss and this floor truss do not rest on this wall. In fact, nothing rests on this wall. Therefore, it is not a load bearing wall. So you could cut this out and remove it. It would make no difference whatsoever. Oh. However, if we come over here, this wall is bearing the load from these um, floor trusses here, ceiling whatever floor trusses. And if we took this wall out, then those would fall down because half the weight is here and half the weight is over there. And so it is bearing the load as a load bearing wall, right? So if you were to, let's say that at some point in, in the future, you would say, I want this gone. Uh -huh. How would I do that? Then the answer is you put in a beam, right? Where? So in this case, that would be darn near impossible to get a post. But for example, let's say this over here, okay? So if you're like, I want to have an open concept for my bathroom, my, my bedroom, so yeah. I wouldn't do. But you can tell what this is, bearing the load, uh -huh. these, right? Uh -huh. So how would I open this up? And the answer is you would temporarily support the ceiling, right? So we put up a board yeah. and then we put vertical supports on it. <clears throat> And then we cut out where the beam is going to be, and we have jack studs, and jack studs take weight all the way to the ground, but then also have the beam sitting on top of it. This is just a header, but yeah. you put a bigger, you know, two by twelve yeah. triple beam, and then come across that, and then land on another jack stud. And then once we did that, we could take cut all this stuff out. Well, you have to cut it out first, and then we relieve the load, and it wouldn't settle at all because it would already be secure in its place. And then we're taking the load from this part. To the two sides, oh, gotcha. and that's how you make an open concept. So that is without having to look through sheetrock how a load bearing wall works and how an open concept and a beam works. Nice. It's not that complicated. Um, I mean, an idiot can do it. Obviously, I can do it. So an idiot can do it. Yeah, you see it on the TV. Right. When we watch our shows. We hear about load bearing walls. And this is that's what it means. So 
Um, any other questions? I I actually do. Okay, what you got? I noticed you got big honking screws coming up in your right. Why where this is supposed to be all wood, right? So what these are, these are um, uh, wedge anchors, okay? Here, we'll get close to it. So what we do, you've got a pressure treated bottom plate, which means that this is guaranteed for life against rotten decay and bugs won't eat it. So it's, it's got um, a chemical in it that they pressurize and then it soaks the whole board and it turns green like that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's so that if there's moisture contact, which there will be, then it doesn't rot your board out and then your whole house settles. But we drill these about every three feet and we drill a hole deep into the concrete about that deep in. And then it's got a, a threaded, um, bolt but at the bottom of it it's got a wedge and when you hammer it in it flares out and sticks into that concrete and so that's not going anywhere and then you tighten this up and the more you tighten it when you pull it up then it flares out that bolt and it just locks it in so oh. we put those all the way around everywhere that we've got a it coming into concrete we've got a wall then about every three feet we put one of these bolts and it makes a huge difference so then when you try to rock the wall the wall is like nah wow. Nah, I'm I don't think they did that in our old house. That's what I heard. <laughs> That's what I heard. <laughs> well, it's beautiful. We're yeah. real excited. Why well, not treat every piece of wood like that? Because of the cost. Yeah. And also, full disclosure, pressure treated wood to burn it is not good for you. There's chemicals in it that if you breathe it, it's probably not good for you. Mm -hmm. And it's got some kind of, I forget what it is, copper oxide or copper something or other. And it's not maybe great for the environment. <laughs> but it is great for your house. Yeah. And so you don't want to pressure treat yeah. all the wood and it makes it much heavier too. So this wood, I don't know if you can kind of feel it, but it feels very light um, because that's pine that's been um, kiln dried. But then this yellow pine is usually what they do this with and they pressure treat it and then it gets like five times heavier. At which point your house, that's a lot more weight to put on your concrete. And, uh, well, I can't wait to do a drywall video. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're getting closer. Every day we're getting closer. So um, anyway, love you guys, man. Love you. Yeah. He loves him. him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love him. I love everybody. Yeah. Hmm. So, uh, today I'm out here by myself with one other person who's filming, and her name is Christina. And um, we are doing piddly, what I call piddly little things. So, we have to put uh, boards up here, nailer boards. Let me show you. Right here, if you're hanging sheetrock, you would have something to nail to all the way along here, and all the way along here, and all the way along here. But here, if you put a piece of sheetrock up, you would not have anything nailed to, so we have to put a piece up there. We also built around the fireplace and did some errand type things, but it came to my attention that perhaps <laughs> not everybody in the world mm -hmm. knows um, a few, what we consider to be common knowledge things. Okay, but if somebody doesn't know, then I assume that other people don't know as well, and so I want to explain. So. A lot of times we say these things wrong and it's our own fault, okay? And by that I say people that know better because it's so common that we just let it go, right? So for example, in the AV business, people call a podium a podium, right? So what you stand at when you're gonna speak is a podium, but technically it's a lectern and the stage you're standing on is a podium. Nobody ever says it. And so when a presenter says, hey, I need a podium up here, then all these people want to chime in and say, oh, but no, technically you're standing on a podium and the lectern's the thing that you, and I'm like, who cares? We know what they're talking about, like, leave it alone. So here's an example, okay? If something is sitting this way, okay, and the bubble is in the middle, that is level, okay? And when, when a wall is what we call level, it's actually plumb. So you read the, the things up here and here, and if it's in the middle, then you're good. So this is technically plumb, not level, and this is level, not plumb. So horizontal is level, vertical is plumb. Interesting fact, yes. All right, Christina, what's on your heart? Nothing. She's shrugging her shoulders and says <laughs> nothing, so I assume that you can only be talking about Psalm 23, so. There you go. <laughs> yeah, was that what you were thinking? Definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. so when I first started going to Grace Community Church, it was a very hard time for me, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I just got a divorce that same week, uh, my first divorce, which was unpleasant. Um, there was lots of tragedy. I was in a lot of debt. Um, things were not going well. I felt like I was probably never going to recover. And I showed up and three different people in one week said, you ought to come to Grace. 
my church. And so <clears throat> I did. And I walked in and our pastor said, we're going to spend the next six weeks talking about Psalm 23. Now I'm not an idiot. And so I know that Psalm 23 is about this big. That's the whole thing. I'm like six weeks on that. All right, I'm listening. And the part that he was on at that, at the day that I showed up was, and though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Right. So I'm going to tell you the whole thing. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Um, and that's it. That's the whole thing. Right. But what he pointed out was that David wrote this psalm. And David was a shepherd, and there really is a place in Israel called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And it's so deep and it's so narrow that sunlight never hits the bottom, and so it's called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. Okay, And so David would graze his sheep on the lowlands, and then they would eat all that up, and he would take them through the Valley of the Shadow of Death. And he reminded us, this is not your final place. This is a place you have to go through to get to higher ground. And I was like, I'm listening. Okay. So he would go through and take the sheep, the whole flock, through the valley of the shadow of death to get to higher ground. Now, sometimes this, the sheep would get spooked, okay? Something would happen and they'd you know, get all antsy or whatever. The shepherd lived with them, and so he would sing to them. Um, and when they heard his voice, they were like, I know it's safe, I know I'm protected because my shepherd is here and he will protect us from anything that comes our way. But sometimes they get really spooked. And so he would take his rod and he would place it on the back of their neck to let them know, I'm not just here, I'm right here. I'm right here next to you. Nothing is gonna get you. Nothing is gonna touch you because I'm right next to you. Nothing will get that close, I promise. And the sheep just, oh. And sometimes I think that we need to realize that, right? Like God's telling us, hey, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And then sometimes he just puts his hand on us and goes, I'm not just here, I'm right here. Like, I've got you, and nothing, the lion and the bear, the wolf, will not attack you because I am bigger than them, and I'm stronger than them. Anyway, that says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So what David would do is he would get to the higher land through the valley of the shadow of death, finally get through that, and like, ah, sunlight and green grass, I want to go eat. And he's like, chill, stay right here for a minute. And he would take his rod and he would poke it around, because there was poisonous snakes, there was asps, and um, there were vipers, and so he would poke around and he would find the snake holes and he would try to kill the snakes. But if he didn't, he would pour oil into the snake holes because the snakes, if, they, if the sheep was grazing and a snake was there and it wanted to strike, then it would be slippery and so it wouldn't get a good strike. But also they hated the smell of it and so they were like, ugh, and they would abandon their holes and go somewhere else, okay? So also another one, part of that that I left out is you anoint my head with oil, which we hear and we're like, oh, that's nice, whatever, right? But he literally poured oil on their heads so that while they were grazing, the snakes wouldn't get them because they were repulsed by the smell. Also, there was nose flies that would buzz all around and they would get in their nose and they would lay eggs inside their sinuses and these eggs would hatch and they would have just thousands of bugs inside their head and it would drive them crazy and they'd smash their heads against rocks and they would just be not in a good place because they got all these bugs inside their face and would drive them crazy. Um, but when he anointed their head with oil, then they would fly all around and they would not land on them and they would not go in their nose. And so he literally, it says, you anoint my head with oil, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He literally prepared a table before them in the presence of their enemies. There were snakes and there was uh, nose flies that did not touch them because he had protected them, he had gone ahead of them clean the land out, and then whatever was left there, he's like, I'll protect you from that too. And I think that's an important lesson for us, um, that God is there and he's watching us and he's putting up safeguards for us. Now we can be dumb, okay? We can be dumb and we can do stuff and we can still get hurt. But overall, he's like, I'm trying to protect you. Okay, so then it says, my cup runneth over, okay? So sheep are very fickle, which I didn't know. And they don't like to put their head down into something. 
which I don't blame them. I don't either. I, when I eat, I don't put my head in a bucket. Um, and so he would, keep, they want it to be overflowing. So he would reach down in the well and pull the bucket of water up and he'd pour it and keep their trough overflowing so that they could just, just lick just the top of the water because they're fickle. Now they had plenty of water underneath that, but he, even though it was more hassle for him, would bring up more and more water because it was more comfortable for them. And so he showed his love by saying, look, your cup runs over. I want to take care of you. I love you. And God does the same thing for us. Like if we're honest, we have far more than what we need. And um, then it says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I just think that that's a truly beautiful analogy. Once you understand that when he's talking about sheep, he's really talking about us and that this is a very real place and it's a very real thing. It's, this is our life. So I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday and I hope you have a wonderful Christmas, even though I'm a Grinch. All right. Hey there. So I just want to apologize. I want to start by apologizing because I haven't really done any videos this week. Um, we've been doing some sketchy stuff up here. Okay. We're all up on scaffolding. We got the other gable done, which is great. Um, we did most of this this morning, which is nice. We still have to wrap around a little bit there. Here in a couple days, we will be past the sketchy stuff and I will be more um, inclined to make some videos, but it's been, it's been sketchy. Am I wrong, Mike? And every day is like the wind and the rain and the fog and the cold and it's just been, <laughs> it's been a beating. Um, anyway, so I wanna to talk to you today about two guys that went to church, okay? And one of these guys, they stood fairly close to each other. And one of these guys, looked up to heaven. He said, God, thank you for making me such a wonderful person. I tithe 10% of my money. I don't do anything on the Sabbath day. I follow all your laws. Pretty much an awesome person. So thank you, God. And he pats himself on the back. This is the story Jesus is telling, by the way. Then there's another guy. He's a tax collector. Tax collectors were <clears throat> people that were Jews that lived in Israel, but the Roman Empire came in and said, hey, you can tax your brothers and sisters and then you can cheat them for more money if you want. And then they did. And so they were pretty much hated. A lot like tax collectors today, but even worse. So <clears throat> this tax collector doesn't even lift his head up. He beats his chest and he just says, God, please forgive me, I'm a sinner. And then Jesus looked at the crowd and he said, which one of these two men went away justified that day? The one that did everything right and was bragging on himself or the one that knew his place? And the crowd is like, I don't know, the good guy? And he's like, no. The one that, because pride comes before a fall, but humility comes before honor. And this guy was full of pride, which is a sin. It's one of the seven, seven deadly sins, right? Like you puff yourself up and you think, I'm so good, I'm so good, I'm so good. You're not. Um, and then the other person is like, I realize my place in life. I'm so sorry, please forgive me. And God's like, I'll forgive you. So think about that because sometimes we need to be brought back down to reality a little bit on what our place is. And really every one of us needs mercy. And so we need to be merciful. And we also need to understand that we need humility because it keeps us humble and you know keeps us from falling. All right, we're gonna go get some lunch. Oh, hey there. So we got quite a bit of uh, stuff done today. Um, all this doesn't look like much, but this is high and complicated and we had to have scaffolding and ladders and ladders on scaffolding and all kinds of things. And to get that done uh, makes our hearts sing. So it is now Christmas Eve Eve where we are. And I don't know where it is, what time it is or what day it is when you're watching this, but it's Christmas Eve Eve. And so I just want to mention that in the middle of all this chaos that is holidays and did I get all the presents that I wanted and did I give all the presents that I needed to and, and, and all the things that we worry about and did we decorate and did we give everybody cards or whatever. I just feel like we need to pause for a minute and just focus on what Christmas is really about. And, and that is Jesus was born into this world so that he would save us. And what a miracle it was. It changed everything. I mean, before him, it was BC and afterwards is AD. Like it, all time changed. Literally everything changed because of him. And he came into our world to, to come and be one of us and then to die for us. And that's a, a big, big deal. Um, and wise men still bring their gifts to Jesus. 
I mean, that's the truth is that wise men still seek after him and they go, this is everything that I have. And I still feel like it's not enough. Um, <clears throat> you know, the story of the little drummer boy, this song, the little drummer boy, he's a poor boy too. And he has, he says, I have no gift to bring, but I can play the drum. And so he does. And when he does, then Jesus smiles at him and that's enough for him. Right. And I just think whatever it is that we have, no matter how big or small, let's bring that to him. And oftentimes the way that we do that is through kindness to people and especially to, to people that can't ever pay you back. Um, so I hope you guys have a wonderful holiday. I'm very excited about the progress here. We'll be back on Monday to do more progress and um, love you guys so much. All right, bye. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, hey there. So it's Monday morning. We just had Christmas. I hope you guys had a wonderful Christmas. Um, we are building this fireplace chimney. Um, and we're learning all kinds of stuff. And hopefully you guys are learning stuff too. So come on over here. I'm going to show you something. So fiberglass, um, if it has paper on it, will burn. But if it's unfaced, it will not burn. And so we can stuff fiberglass all around this thing. Now, not on top of it, because heat rises, obviously. Um, but we can stuff it all around there. Jimmy, you got your lighter on you? I do. Here, let's, let's see that thing. We're just going to do a quick demonstration so you can learn. How's this thing work? I don't, even, I don't do drugs. Um, no, you don't have to do drugs. It helps, but you don't have to. So look, that's on fire, right? Not at all. Yeah, but it won't actually catch no, fire. They, that's even with like a full-on flame on it. And then, look, not even hot. Cool to the touch. Yep. Pretty rock and roll. So, Perfect. now speaking of extinguishing fires, uh, I think about this a lot, right? When we were younger, people used to say to us, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all. And I think we forgot that. And I think that we've, we've replaced that with, I just, I'm honest with people. I'm just brutally honest. If they can't take it, then that's their fault. But that's not nice, right? Like no. if you have the choice to be right or to be kind, choose kind. You, you don't have to tell everybody your opinion about every last thing all the time. You can simply let it go. And you know what else you can do? When you're really, really mad, because it takes a lot to get me mad, but sometimes I do get mad, I'm not gonna lie. And when I'm really, 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 really mad, this is the point where I'm like, I could tell you off in the best way possible that I will 100% regret and never be able to take back. And you'll remember that for the rest of your life. And you'll think that's how John thinks about me. And I don't want that. So whenever I'm like really, 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 really mad, and it's probably not 100% your fault. It's probably a lot of factors that all came together and then I put it on you. And I'm like, I'm gonna need a minute. <laughs> and then I go away and I cool off. Yeah, I go somewhere else and I cool off for the amount of time it takes me to get my head on right so I don't say something mean that I can't take back. I think good that's policy. good. That's great policy. I think that's a good, a good policy. Yeah, for real. So anyway, we're going to keep working. We're getting more siding done. We're going to get this gable um, stitched up today. And um, it's a beautiful day out here. So obviously we're, we're not in the cold because, you know, Texas in December. But um, we will talk to you soon. Huh. So today we did siding soffit fascia, siding soffit fascia. We built this chimney up here. We didn't get it all the way done because I had to go get more materials, but we got materials for tomorrow. Um, and then we did some siding up here and we just have to finish this right here, which is all sketchy and it's all high stuff. I'm not gonna lie. Um, but hopefully we'll be in the dry soon. Very, very soon. And I'm very grateful for that. Now I wanna tell you what else I'm grateful for. Um, some of you guys know, um, those that hang out with me a lot, know that um, my dad is not in a good place right now, okay? And so I wanna tell you about this real quick, not so that you'll feel sorry for him, but because it's a praise, I think, okay? So my dad has been homeless my entire life um, since he was a teenager and he's 69 years old. So whatever that is, close to 50 years, maybe, maybe more. Um, I had not seen him. I didn't meet him till I was 27 and I hadn't seen him in a decade. Um, and then all of a sudden he kind of popped up and he's been maybe on the edge of sanity sometimes. Um, but recently he has been much more sane, like in the last several months. And so I'm very grateful for that. We've had real conversations and I'm very grateful for that. Now, um, some of you know that I went down to Mexico a couple months back and that's because we found out that he had a huge, huge skin cancer across his face that comes like across here 
and then all the way across the back and it just looks i can post pictures but i'm not going to put it in the main thing because it's hard to look at his eyes completely closed over um and he's got a thing about that big on his ankle that's just an open wound and he's he's not in a good place physically right so um i went to mexico to visit with him because he finally had an address for the first time ever and i helped get him down there and so i went to visit him and i was very grateful for that time but because things happened he ended up coming up here and so um my friend colby who i love my neighbor colby who i love said take him to jps and i'm like that's kind of like the you know the not great hospital and he's like bro that's where I, where I went when my back got broken and they took good care of me mm -hmm. And so I went to JPS and I expected almost nothing. I expected to be sitting in the lobby for 10 hours and get horrible service and be, be treated badly and whatever. And I just want to tell you what I was greeted with. He, so my dad last week went completely blind and his other eye too. And so that's got to be unbelievably difficult for him. So I parked up front in the emergency and I walked him in and I said, hey, he can't see. I'll be right back. I'm going to go park the car. And I went and parked the car thinking 10 hours from now, we might get to possibly see a doctor maybe, but they'll probably tell us to come back tomorrow. I got back from the parking lot and came in and they were like, where have you been? He's got a room, he's been waiting for you. They knew my name, they knew his name. I was like, what planet is this right now? <laughs> they had a eye doctor look at his eye. They did a sonogram on his eye, the one good one. Um, they had cancer doctors come in, they took biopsies. I mean, they, would, they just took care of him unbelievably and we're so very very kind and understanding and i just can't tell you how much that meant to me and to him um for them to be so kind and so understanding and so helpful um sadly they did give him a diagnosis that what he has is terminal and that nothing that we can do is going to help him um and that's a hard thing for anybody to hear that's a hard thing for anybody to hear is like you won't come back from this you're gonna die we don't know how long but you're gonna die but he just took that and went, okay, well, I'll make the best of what I've got left. He doesn't complain. He doesn't, he's got a pain chart on the wall, you know, that goes from zero to 10. Keep in mind, this guy's got to be in excruciating pain. I mean, seriously, like it is hard to look at. And I looked up at his wall and he's got his pain at a zero, at a zero. He straight up refuses any pain medication. And I'm just like, wow. And he has his flaws, we all have our flaws. But I gotta say, I have such a tremendous amount of respect for him. He came all the way across the country without being able to see, with no money, being homeless. It's incredible. With, with everything <clears throat> that he owned on his back, I'm sorry. Um, and he got here and he is tough and he just makes it through and he has a good attitude and all he cares about is helping other people. And that makes me want to be a better person. So um, I hope you guys are having a wonderful evening. I am so very, very grateful to all the medical staff up there and to everybody who's been so supportive and has tried to pray and and um, and talk to me. It means so very much. So um, have a good night. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Okay.